So hello, uh, hello guys, welcome to another stream. Um, I think that's not a bad time to do this kind of streaming stuff. And today I will try out a new streaming software. So bear with me if anything is not working as it should. So um, I now have to do some stuff and prepare. It's not yet half eight. So let's see. So bear with me. So it's going to be probably quite boring. But what I want to do is to have some uh, something like a Q&A where you can ask questions. And I will go to these kind of questions. So oh, yeah, it's working. Oh, I can. So you can hear me, I assume. Yeah, I can hear myself. That's fine. Yeah. OK, so it seems to be working. Now let me just try. Let me just try to share my screen. OK, so at some point, I only have something like 30 minutes. So it will probably just end because I was playing around a little bit for some time. Um, let me just share screen. Tuck, tuck. So you should now be able to see this screen. And I'm still there. All right, that's good. OK, OK. So let's see, make it a little bit bigger. OK, so it fits also the YouTube screen. Very good. OK, so we have Pablo. Pablo is in the chat on YouTube. That's nice. So uh, please start uh, writing down questions so I can answer them. Uh, it's really more like a Q&A for, for 20 minutes, maybe 25, depending on how long the program lets me do it. And yeah, Hassan is also there. Yeah, as I was saying, so please ask questions either on YouTube and I can then answer them and we'll see how it goes. Uh, so instead of just waiting for some questions, I will just show you today how I actually approach something like this. And generally every ankle joint. So if I open an ankle joint and this is now let's just pick any like random case here so for example this one here let me just see what this is i have no clue what this is about so typically i start off with something like a sagittal term or stir sequence where i just have a look at the general situation you can see bone meridimas you can see the state of the joints etc. So it gives you already quite a good idea of what to expect. And the first thing I assess is always the joints and joint fluid and bones in general, because it's a large part of the scan is always bones. Um, then you just start at the top and I can now zoom in a little bit, just make it a little bit bigger. And for those of you who joined later, just ask questions. It's more like a Q&A today, not necessarily me teaching you a specific topic. So just pop your questions in the chat, and we can try to answer them. So far, there's no question. OK. So starting with the bone, we can see the ankle joint here is not too bad. We don't see any bone meridima. It's worth having a look also um, something like a coronal view to check for osteochondral defects, uh, especially here on the medial and on the lateral tailor shoulders. We have to be careful sometimes here at this corner. There can be quite a significant defect in the tibial side. And this is not a osteochondral defect. This is an anatomic variant. It's called the notch of party. And oh, that's great. I can now see that. Muris is live. OK, very good. So let me just write something in the other chat. So the reason I have a new tool, uh, it's on Crowdcast, where I have a little bit more functionality. That's what I actually want to try. Please ask questions. So Muris is also encouraged to ask questions. 
So coming back here to, to uh, these kind of uh, holes, when you see something like this, it's called the notch of Harty, and it's just an anatomic variant and should not be called a Oster-Control defect or something like that. Very good. Then once we have assessed the ankle joint, we go to the subtalar joint and we can start to see whether there is any cartilage damage, whether you have a coalition, that's something you always have to look out for, whether there is bone marrow edema here on the posterior facet, in the middle facet and the anterior portion here. So always give a close look to the anterior process of the calcaneus because you can have subtle fractures here that can be easily missed. Now, when you are already here at this level, go check the rest of the calcaneus. Don't fall for something like this kind of uh, intraosseous ganglionsis that can occur here in Gisan's wing uh, angle. And the, you can check for something like a plantar spur, which is not really important. So, so AJ is asking, is this the standard way to review ankle joint or is this pattern reviewing the ankle the way you prefer? So, so he's asking whether what I'm showing you currently is the standard way or that it's just my way. So it's certainly my standard way, uh, AJ. So it's always the same approach uh, for me, uh, regardless what the preferring physician wants to know. I uh, can ju just quickly repeat. So starting off with the bones, then ligaments, then um, after I switched us also syndesmosis, all the other ligaments. Then we go on to tendons. And then lastly is soft tissue and musculature. But we will now go through it. So ankle joint, top, next, this one. And then you just work yourself this way, right? Just to have a very organized approach. And then you don't miss any minor findings. You assess the Chopper joint here, also talonavicular joint. And we can already see here there is some bony growth here where the joint capsule is inserting. And then we have some mild osteoarthritis here. Um, Alex Peterson asked, do you use ABCS approach? Not necessarily. So the my templates are also in my book, Speed MSK Radiology. And I have a specific template for every joint. However, if there is like, like um, something that's not really covered in a standard protocol, maybe just the lower extremity, but not specifically the ankle or the knee, then I always start with a similar approach. So bone and soft tissue in that order, because I always start with the bone and then work my way through. But not um, I don't have an abbreviation for this. It's uh, I don't recall this. So Hassan is asking, how do you evaluate the spring ligament? Yeah, let me just finish with the bones here quickly. So we have some osteoarthritis here. It's not very fancy. Don't forget to look at the most anterior portions of the foot. Even if you just focus on the ankle, you can sometimes see fractures, stress fractures, osteoarthritis, etc., and also the lesser toes. Now, moving on to the ligaments. And as Hassan was asking how to evaluate the spring ligament, I have a very, uh, I've given a lecture on the last year's Radiopedia conference. And there is an easy way to assess the spring ligament. So you can start on the transfer sections. You scroll down to the calcaneus, right? And so just for you, this is medial, this is lateral. So you scroll down to the calcaneus and at some point the calcaneus makes here kind of a 90 degree angle, right? And from this angle, you have two ligaments that are going this way and this way. So these are also part of the spring ligament complex. But the important one is the supromedial portion of the spring ligament complex. This one here, it's best seen on the coronals. So you basically have the delta ligament here. And as soon as it's getting a little bit thicker down here, this is the supromedial portion of the spring ligament. This is the tibio spring ligament, which is a part of the or a superficial delta ligament, and this is the superomedial spring ligament complex, and that's the one that we really want to assess. The ones down here that are showed here on this image, so 
medial plantar oblique and infraplantar longitudinal one. They are not really important. Um, surgeons don't go in and fix them, but it's just nice to know where they are. In between, you can have a little recess, spring ligament recess, but it's not really important. So going back here to the spring ligament here, so it's a little bit thicker. And on transverse sections, you can also see it. So here, so it's just here. This is the posterior tibial tendon, talus, tailor hat. And in between, you have the supramedial spring ligament complex, which is connecting the calcaneus with the navicular bone. Therefore, also the name calcaneonavicular ligament or supramedial calcaneonavicular ligament. So that's it. Um, but that's not the first ligament I look at. So I always start off with the syndesmosis after finishing with the bones, right? Just see whether there are any other questions. Um, Spring Pablo is asking, greetings from Peru. Nice. How do you localize OC lesions in the Taylor Dome? Do you use any particular classification? Do you prefer to measure diameter or area of OC lesions? Okay, so the way they are best seen is just on the coronals because they are typically are at the same location anyways. So or always like on the medial tailor shoulder or on this area here. And the way I uh, describe them, I just say there is a small um, uh, moderate or severe osteochondral lesion with, then I describe subchondral cysts and I describe bone marrow edema. If there is a very obvious cartilage damage, I typically just give the diameter um, in one plane. So probably on this one, if I can see it nicely, and I also describe the depth of the defect. So sometimes you have larger defects, and I just described that the cartilage defect is going down to the bone. But I don't measure the area uh, normally, unless it's like a very specific thing. But imagine you have a defect of this size here, like from this, this edge here is missing. So you would measure probably this diameter, then you would switch over to a sagittal and you will try to measure something in the AP diameter. And it's quite hard to give an exact area anyways, because you don't know the exact uh, orientation. So if you were to go on a something like this here, let's start here. So you would probably see here sometimes defects like this. You could technically measure it with a freehand tool, but I think it's too much information um, and maybe more something for studies, right? And I don't use the classification systems uh, because there are different ones. I'm not a big fan of grading systems in general. They are mostly invented for study purposes and hardly really uh, help too much. OK, thanks, Alex. Thanks for the compliment. And Tronir is asking questions from Hungary. How often do you see subtalar lateral hind foot impingement in place plano valgus without tip post spring ligament tendinopathy. I feel like it's more common than it should be. So with impingement in the foot in general, as in all other parts of the body, I think impingement by definition is something very dynamic, right? It's something mostly soft tissue that's actually impinging between other structures. And it's really hard to appreciate on static images. And if you have the clinical information that this patient has impingement, then it might be different. But if you have seen my ankle impingement series, then I say it basically in every video that it's uh, a clinical diagnosis and we can try to see a sequel of that. The studies are not like very uh, convincing, at least not like in a prospective way. And if you, you were just to look at some images, you can see stuff and the patient will not have impingement and vice versa. For example, bony spurs, etc. Soft tissue edema might not correlate at all. Um, Ostrigonum with any kind of edema does not necessarily have to be clinically relevant at all. So um, not a big fan. And also the other part of the question, tibial spring ligament and spring, um, tip post, so tibialis posterior tendon and spring ligament tendinopathy. So these are also very vague terms. So in a sense, you can have signal changes here. Sometimes it's thick, sometimes it's not. And it's not always so obvious. Um, that's just the truth. So 
you can always go on and say it's tendinopathy, but tendinopathy is something that nobody can prove you wrong. So it's always something you can say, but it's probably not always really important. So um, it's not a very clear answer thrown here, but it's really the whole impingement stuff is very difficult. And it's really more to see if there are any other structures or maybe a, a anatomic abnormality, something like that, and uh, some kind of irritations to rule out different stuff. So we'll see. Um, so go to so I recommend you check the ankle impingement or the ankle impingement videos that are on YouTube. I think I have that explained there in more detail. I don't have the time now. So just to say, basically, um, I'm testing out a new software here. And at some point, I will just disconnect because I just have a time limit of 30 uh, minutes for this trial. And if I'm not there anymore, that that was it. All right. So no hard feelings. Okay, so we were through the bones and we will now start at the ligaments. And as I said, I always start off with the syndesmosis. Syndesmosis because it's the uh, most, uh, let's say, proximal portion. So I can go through it in an anatomic fashion. So we have the anterior syndesmosis. You can see these different bundles here very nicely. Sometimes you can see a a little bit separated bundle on the most inferior portion of the anterior syndesmosis. Some people call it the basset ligament, or it's called the basset ligament, but it's actually just part of the anterior syndesmosis, the most inferior portion. And I think it's quite nicely seen here, at least part of it. The slice thickness is quite thick. If it's very thick, some believe that it can cause some friction there and impingement, etc. And sometimes they just have to release it. But it's not a separate ligament in an anatomic sense, depending on which article you are reading, but actually part of the anterior syndesmosis. And I think this is a nice example. You can see you have these different dots. And sometimes it's really like multiple different bands of uh, lig or bands that just form the anterior syndesmosis. Now, you don't want to have edema there. We can go and check it here. Not here. There are some vessels around it. That's not really a problem. Then you try to assess the posterior syndesmosis here. So also no, nothing really remarkable. And once you have covered the syndesmosis, you go on and describe the lateral ligaments or the medial ones, depending on what you want to do. But I typically start off with the lateral ligaments, because you just scroll down and you are already at the right side. Now with the lateral ligaments, any person in his or her life had ankle distortions at some point or another, and it's very often just a little bit scarred, a little bit thickened, it might look a little bit brighter than in a maybe 15 year old patient. So if it's not really super smooth, black, then it's probably okay to call it a little bit scarred. Sometimes it's very thin. Then I just say it's a little bit thinned out. But as long as you don't have edema around it and you can see the fibers in continuation, it's not like it's an acute injury. And whether it's scarred, whatever, if it's not like an acute setting, it's not really important. But um, just be mindful that the ligament can have a lot of different varieties. And I suggest you don't overcall any signal abnormality, exit partial tear, especially not in an acute setting. Now, this is just the anterior tibiofibular ligament. And then the second one is this one here. So the best way to identify the LFC, the ligamentum fibrocalcaneare, is you just go from the tip and it makes kind of this form. And down here, these are the peroneal tendons. So you have the ligament, it's this black structure here, just between the peroneal tendons and the calcaneus. They insert here onto the lateral aspect of the calcaneus and their origin is up here. So you should be able to see a black ligament in most patients here, unless it's very bright, edematous, um, maybe there it's even torn, but it's not the case in this patient. So I look at this ligament. Now, there's one thing I can mention here, maybe. I think it's helpful. Um, so, Hassan is asking syndesmosis, anterior and posterior tibiofibular ligaments. Yes, that's that's correct. So, 
as you mentioned, the, the tibiofibular ligaments, so tibia and fibula, it's connecting both of them. So this is the syndesmosis. There are some additional fibers like up here, uh, but I've got a separate video about this um, from the incisura fibularis. Go check it out on the YouTube channel. Um, yeah, so you can still see me. I'm just trying a few different things. It's not much happening over here. Okay. So questions. What, what what's happening? Can I ask a question? Questions ask. No, it's nothing. Let me just try something. Create a poll. Okay. Can you see a poll now on the screen? No, I don't think so. I'm not really sure. Maybe they just stream this over to YouTube, I guess. Okay, makes kind of sense. Anyways, going back here, uh, ligament, and then the last one is the posterior talofibular ligament, PTFL, and it's this ligament on the back here. This ligament is hardly ever torn, so don't spend too much time thinking, where is it, whether this one is actually intact or not. It's most of the time intact, and it's often, I think I can show it here, it's often also a little bit like uh, wavy in appearance. So this is ligament is pr practically always intact. Now, once you've done the lateral ligaments, you do the medial ligaments. You want to have the nice striation, which is not the case here. This one are a little bit uh, scarred after all the trauma probably. So the deep portion and the superficial portion with the, on the posterior aspect, the tibio, um, calcaneal ligament and the tibio spring and then there is an anterior one tibio uh, navicular which is not easy to see anyways now next thing you also want to mention is the spring ligament complex that we have already covered once you finish that you want to assess the tendons and the tendons are best seen on the axials as well you start with any group so they are the the flexor tendons, perineal tendons, and extensor tendons. And I suggest to start with, it doesn't really matter, just take, pick one and stick with it. So we have the tibialis anterior tendon, the other flexor tendons. Just make sure you go all the way down to the insertion of the anterior uh, tibialis tendon, because it can sometimes have pathology there, tendinopathy, irritations, etc. And this is frequently missed because we tend to focus on the posterior parts like flexor tendons and peroneal tendons. Then check the flexor tendons, especially tip post. Some fluid is normal. Maybe it's a tick too much here in this patient. We also have some vessels here all around here. And then we have the FDL and the FHL. And one important thing is once you're at this level, make sure you don't miss any accessory muscles in this region because they are frequently missed uh, because they just look normal. It doesn't catch your eye, but I think it's important to mention them just to give a indication that you actually really looked at the images in a concentrated way. So then perineal tendons, and we can see here now we have tenosynovitis of the perineal tendons. This amount of fluid is certainly not normal on the perineal tendons and the perineus brevis tendon is clearly flattened and probably here also split, like we've got one portion here, one portion here, it looks like a Mickey Mouse, here and here, and then mostly they will join back together. But again, it's like very significant tenosynovitis, and then they insert at the base of the fifth metatarsal. Okay, once that's done, then you uh, switch over and you can have a look at the soft tissue. And in the soft tissue, you can have a look at the musculature, especially here on the plantar aspect. If it's very fatty degenerated, it might be from diabetes. You want to see whether there is isolated atrophy of the abductor digiti minimi, for example, in Baxter's neuropathy. Um, just look for edema of the foot, like soft tissue edema in the subcutaneous fat tissue, plantar side. Um, I forgot to mention that after the tendons, I have a look also, or during the tendon assessment, always always look also at the Achilles tendon and the plantar aponeurosis and its insertion or origin rather here. So don't forget this. Yeah, that's 
basically the approach for ankle joint just one two three four five and that's it do it for everything um other questions has magic angle artifact ever caused you to misdiagnose or suspect tendinopathy is it a common problem it is certainly a, a problem that magic angle can make tendons look silly and you can overcall tendinopathy that certainly has happened to me i'm pretty sure but i'm not a big caller of tendinopathy anyways because as i said you can always say it and you will never be in a position where somebody can actually prove you wrong i only give it if it's really obvious so the tendon does not only have to have a different signal but it has also to be like thickened I don't think that's enough if you just have little signal alterations. I think it also really needs to be thickened. And that's especially true in the shoulder, like supraspinatus tendon. It's something where people always say tendinopathy when I just think it's still within normal limits. And always ask yourself, what if, uh, like, if you call this tendinopathy, like in a 70-year-old patient, in a tendon that's otherwise not too shabby? Or let me, maybe I can quickly open the case for you guys. Let me just try whether this works. So here, I think um, it's a 20 year old something patient. And so if you're now here at this level in the supraspinatus, so here now 20 year old something, if you think this is tendinopathy, I would argue it's probably normal and not a tendinopathy really, because if you call this tendinopathy, then every patient from now on in your practice will have to have tendinosis. So you can go check um, other younger patients and it's not always just black like this. You have at this area here, maybe not like this. So this is something I discussed with another colleague just recently. Um, but if it's just a little bit higher signal and not thick and like it's not bulging or anything, I don't even call it tendinosis. I hope this answers your questions. And Pablo is asking regarding Achilles tendon tear, did any orthopedic surgeon ask you about fascia cruris lesion? What's your opinion about the performance of MRI for post-operative Achilles tendon? So I don't remember a orthopedic surgeon asking me specifically for the fascia cruris lesion. And I think post-operative Achilles tendon assessment with MRI can be done it's um, depending on how much susceptibility artifacts from the intervention, it can be tricky. Um, I think ultrasound is really great for that because you can do some dynamic assessment, but I think it's just um, how it is. So I think, yeah, that's, that's what I would say. Yeah. So yeah, let me just try something here i've got one people in the other software okay okay pulse one votes two votes okay answered okay okay yeah so it seems to be working streaming from crowdcast to youtube that's one thing I wanted to try. And the other thing, I, th I think I've got one minute left. So um, before everything collapses because of my 30 minute time limit, I um, want to say thank you for tuning in. Um, it was just a quick test here. And I really want to do more live streaming. I just have to figure out the best way or the best software to do it. So, but I think I like this one. Maybe the other one is also not so bad. So we'll see about that in the future. Yeah, thanks for tuning in. Um, just uh, hit the thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. But I think you all are anyway subscribed. Otherwise, you wouldn't have found this stream. And um, I wish you all a happy weekend and see you next time. Oh, Achilles Hegel versus goggle lesion in non orthogram images. Well, that's not a topic I can cover in 30 seconds. Hey, Daniel. Yeah, hi, Dan. How's it going? <laughs> uh, can you tell me about some live stream stuff I've used? 
yeah then i wanted to text with you uh, anyways uh, next week so it's going to be uh, interesting to see how your experience was with uh, crowdcast